If you were here with us last week, Pastor Roy, bless you, Pastor Roy uh, kicked things off for one of my favorite Bible stories ever. For those of you that don't know my history here, the, the search team liked me and picked me to be the pastor because they knew that I took me and six friends and we, seven of us, started a brand new church a few years back and grew it to a whopping eight people. Very impressive, I know. Very impressive. And that church was called Jacob's Well Church, if that tells you how much I love this story and how much I love this text. Because what is Jacob's Well? It's where we meet Jesus when all we were expecting was a drink of water. Why? Because our Savior came to us in this text. Sometimes, hence the uh, title of the sermon today. Do we have, we do? So today's sermon, out of the part six out of eight of Saints and Sinners, this chap, this, these two chapter segment of John, chapter three and four, are putting stories side by side of Nicodemus, who was really religious and he struggled. How do I relate to God? And then this woman and a story after that Conrad's going to preach in a couple weeks, a couple of outsiders, people who had never been to church. And they're all struggling in their own way of how I relate to Jesus. And, and the text is supposed to show us that whether you've been in church your entire life or you've never been to church, Jesus is coming for you. He's coming for you. And he is going to introduce you to the Father and you're going to have to make a decision. That makes sense? Nicodemus, we only know from later in the Gospel of John that he eventually does grasp it on a heart level and worship Jesus. We see it later in the book of John. But at the time, Nicodemus is stumped. He's taught seminary classes, but he doesn't understand what God is saying about how to actually be in relationship with God. And we're going to see something different with this woman. Pastor Roy told us last week a little bit of how Jews and Samaritans did not hang out, did not associate. Uh, Samaritans were half-breed, lots of Assyrian blood. And worse than that, the, the Samaritans had a syncretized religion where they said they worshipped Jehovah. They took the first five books of the Bible and recognized those. They did not recognize the rest of the Hebrew Bible. So you think that's a little bit offensive to Jews? Say yes. yes. Okay. We've rejected, you know, four-fifths of your Bible. That's pretty offensive. Um, so, so who, uh, this is going to, this will divide the old, old timers, but if you've been around church a long time, you guys know the story of Nehemiah trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Okay. You'll remember a bad guy named Sanballat. Sanballat is coming in and trying to sow dissension. He does not want the walls of Jerusalem to be rebuilt. And this is not recorded in Scripture. We know this from uh, extra-biblical history. One of Sanballat's tools to create dissension and division is he funded the construction of a temple for the Samaritans who insisted they worship at Gerizim. This is going to matter in a second. So the Samaritans go, Mount Gerizim is the holy mountain. Jews are saying, Moriah. Where, Jerus where Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac, you know, what we today call the Temple Mount. Okay, so there's this fight, and Sanbal, hundreds of years ago, Sanbal, it says, here, Samaritans, here's a bunch of cash, B build yourselves a temple. Do you think that ups the ante for how much these two groups hate each other? Say yes. yes. All right? As 21st century Americans, we, we don't understand this whole God of location. How is God so tied to a location? Except his own book, his own law said, Okay, now's the time. You're going to build, he said to, to David, your hands have spilt too much blood. You're not going to do this. I'll have your son do it. He chose the location. This is where my, pre and even before that, with the tabernacle, my presence is going to reside inside this tabernacle that you built. So a huge fight to make matters worse. It just keeps getting better. To make matters worse, there's a Jewish revolt about 170 years before Jesus was born. So 200 years before this conversation, there's a Jewish revolt where they go into Samaria and destroy the Samaritan temple at Gerizim. So not only is Jesus standing there talking to a Samaritan woman at the well. Pastor Roy wasn't joking. There's something going on with this thing. Uh, there is this hundreds of year old fight. They're standing there at the foot of Mount Gerizim. They are there within a stone's throw, so to speak of this destroyed temple. And she's about to bring up, I'm, I'm saying this all as, uh, to lay the, the foundation, ooh, that was terrible, uh, lay the foundation of, of where this fight comes from. They are almost right next to the ruins of a destroyed temple. Like, there's no love lost here. There's just no love lost. Uh, we called, I called this today, this doctor makes house calls, because we're going to see in this juxtaposition between his conversation with Nehemiah, who came to who in John chapter 3? 
for those of you who are here. Nicodemus came to Jesus. And today, who's coming to who? Yeah, Pastor Roy shared with us last week, Jesus had to go. The text says he had to go through Samaria. So that points to divine appointment because there's nothing geographically that forces him to walk down this road. He believes his father wants to go make worshipers and he's going to do it even in Samaria. Read with me if you would. We're going to tackle verses 15 through 26. We're coming into the middle of this conversation. There at the well, he's asked for water. It's very culturally weird. Why are we talking to each other? What's going on? He promises living water. If you just knew who was standing in front of you, you'd ask me for a drink and I would give you living water. So we're going to pick it up. In 15, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get water. Weird statement number one. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Does anybody think that's a weird statement from Jesus besides me? Right? If you knew who was standing in front of you, you'd ask me for a drink, and I would give you living water that, what, bubbles up to eternal life. Okay, give it to me. Go get your husband. At least two possibilities. And we're humans. We can be wrong hundreds of times a day, so maybe even both of these options are wrong. Some commentators say that because he is offering her eternal life, connection to Jehovah, which is ultimately going to be through his blood when he dies on a cross after this to wash this woman's sins away, she is not, he is respecting the spiritual leadership of a husband to say, oh, you guys are about to worship Jehovah, but I am not going to, this is like, you know, if, if Mormons come to your door, they want to share their message with the entire family not just have part of the family here. It is possible that he knows a spiritual transformation is about to happen and he wants to respect the spiritual leadership of her husband. I want to share this living water with your entire family, not just with you. One possible interpretation of what's going on. A second interpretation that I saw more people sharing, seeming to agree with this one, um, is Jesus knows that reconciliation to the Father happens when we admit that we are sinners and only when we admit we're sinners can we embrace the forgiveness he offers through his own cross. So I might raise my hand if you say, do you want a self-help book? you want to go to a cool seminar that's going to help you be a better you? Um, I might say I want something new. I want something better. Eternal life, that sounds good. Living water, that sounds good. And Jesus is saying, you can't have living water if you won't start by admitting that you're a sinner. I cannot give you what I have for you if you still think you're morally perfect on your own. It's a big deal. That was for free. Anyway, verse 17, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you've had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Can we stop for a second? How does Jesus know that? There was no Instagram feed for this lady to take all of her unethical decisions and just post them out to the world. Anybody seen that Facebook meme? Santa Claus just saw your Instagram feed. You're getting a pair of pants and a Bible for Christmas. (laughs) Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, so, is she changing the topic? I love it when I have a question and I go look at what all the theologians say and they have one very clear, good, comprehensive answer that makes sense. Did you know there isn't one for this? Second big conundrum of the text, at least for me. A lot of people say she's changing the topic. She's talk- I don't want to talk about my sin. I don't want to talk about my junk. Let's talk about a a, a religious slash political fight. This is basically like, okay, so I hear you're sleeping with your girlfriend. He's like, well, what do you think of Donald Trump? (laughs) You know, like, we all think politics is the worst thing to talk about. It's not true. If you bring up my sin when I didn't want to talk about my sin, I'll talk politics. Because politics is at least out there. It's at least out there a little layer. Don't talk about my junk. 
So that's probably the, the dominant interpretation. So, something else that, I, as I studied, that some people believe is going on here is actually a very rational question from her. If she does genuinely, if she's not sassing him, if she genuinely believes she has stumbled across a uh, prophet of the living God, then she might be looking for her version of a Messiah. And here's what I mean. What is your messianic expectation in the first century AD, which Jesus just stood, walked up, so she doesn't even know BC is about to be AD. Little humor, very little. What is your expectation back then of Messiah if you only take the first five books of the Bible as being true. Right? And the virgin shall be with child. You will call him Emmanuel. The weight of the government will be on his shoulders. Oh, wait, I'm a Samaritan. I don't believe in Isaiah. Toss that one out the window. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their sons and the sons to their fathers. Oh, that's a good... Oh, wait, I don't believe in Malachi because I'm a Samaritan. Toss that one out the window. What do I have to work with? I virtually have one verse. Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, where Moses says, a prophet's going to come like me and you'll actually listen to him. So no bitterness on Moses' part whatsoever. <laughs> You jerks. In Deuteronomy 18, 18, Moses says, one is going to come and you're going to actually listen to him. And the text calls him a prophet. So the Samaritan view of Messiah, when she says in a little bit that I know the Messiah will come and he will explain all things to us, that's because that's her understanding of Messiah. Her understanding of Messiah as a Samaritan is that one is going to come, he is from God, and he's going to answer all of our questions. It's up here. It's not down here. Living water is down here, folks. Living water is where I am shown my sin by the Most High God, and in the same breath, he says, I still love you. I'm still doing relationship with you. I'm going to the cross soon to wash away your sin. She's expecting an up here Messiah. She found one that works down here. So it is possible that if something in her heart believes that this is the Samaritan version of the Messiah, he could actually settle once and for all this fight between Gerizim and Mar Moriah. If he's the one, then he will know the absolute answer and he'll be able to make it clear. It's possible she genuinely wants to hear the answer to the question. And whether she's expecting it or not, she absolutely gets the truth. Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Isn't it cool? There is a correct answer. The scriptures which she had rejected said, I want to be worshipped on this mountain. There was a right answer. The Samaritans were wrong. But Jesus doesn't bother diving in with the theological details because the details are about to change. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. You know, like Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is all you have to work with, for example. While we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. Does it say to or through? Yeah, coming, coming through the Jews means salvation comes to non-Jews. Anybody happy that Jesus' blood washes away the sin of non-Jews also? Are we happy? That one matters. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus told her, what? I am the Messiah. Did he stutter? I'm not asking you, I'm asking the Discovery Channel. Did Jesus stutter right there? Or did he use the divine name about himself? John has seven of these. 
We're going to keep stumbling across them as we move through this book. This is how to get yourself crucified in a devout Jewish culture. Why does the first I am statement come to a girl who's never been to church and who's theologically mixed up and has, has made a lot of moral mistakes? Why does that? Why is she fundamentally getting more of who Jesus is than, say, all the Jews at the wedding at Cana before this? The Samaritans are not one inch away of crucifying the Messiah. The Jews are. Jesus can be unbelievably authentic. He doesn't have to hide behind the veiled Son of Man title for himself with Samaritans. He just says, I am. For those of you note takers who never thought we would get there, sometimes we come to church looking for answers. Sometimes church has to come to us. How many of you Christians know that one? Sometimes, like Nicodemus, we come toward our Messiah with questions in the holster. I got all these questions. Rapid fire. Let's see how well Jesus can do with all my questions. Or increasingly, the way the Western world operates now I'm not coming. We are 13 minutes from kickoff. You guys know that? Some of you guys are watching a score right now. No, uh, the pregame. <laughs> kickoff from the most financially lucrative sport on planet Earth, depending on how you measure it, British Premier League is a lot of cash too, depending on how the pound sterling is doing. The NFL has 32 gargantuan temples across our country where people come to worship on Sundays. And in case you think I'm throwing shade, I love me. How about them cowboys? I love me some football. But... Troy Aikman is not going to be there at the pearly gates to decide whether or not I've been washed clean. Tony won't be there. I mean, he might be there to commentate. All right, here comes Greg down the five, down the ten, trying to make it into... Does he make it to heaven? Touchdown! You know, he might commentate, but he does not decide whether I am washed in Christ's blood and forgiven of sin. Does he? So I am not going to that temple when that temple cannot provide me with what I need. It just can't. One pastor I enjoy listening to, he says, idolatry is very rarely a bad thing. Usually it is a good thing elevated to a God thing. Sex isn't bad, but if you put it as your ultimate of your existence, you'll be crushed under the weight of it. Money, it's not a bad thing. But if you make it your ultimate, you'll be crushed under the weight of it or crushed under the pursuit of it. Success is not a bad thing. But if you make it your ultimate, you'll be crushed under the weight of it. When will you know you're done? When will you know you're a success? We've got football. We've got Starbucks we could be doing on Sundays. We've got golf. I've got all kinds of things. Man, as an American, mathematically speaking... But whether it's an actual television, which almost not, nobody watches anymore, but that's fine, but actual television, or watching Netflix on a screen, or Hulu, or whatever streaming service, I'm looking at a screen now about six hours a day. Six. And in case you think I'm here to throw shade at people who aren't Christians, actually, I'd just love to get the Christians to read their Bible as much as we're consuming other things. That would be awesome. I think Citrus Heights would really know that we were different when we're more marked by the word than we are marked by whatever entertainment we pursue, right? But here's my point. Most of us, and when I say us, I mean America, most of us are not here right now. Look around the room and, at, and ask yourself the population of Citrus Heights and then look around the room. Are most of us here? Okay. Now, to be sure, there are plenty of not enough, but there are plenty of good, Jesus-centered churches in our city. So this is not the whole group. 
But mathematically speaking, only about 5% of California is in church on a given Sunday morning. One out of 20, mathematically speaking. This means sometimes, like in California in the 21st century, church is going to have to come to us because I am at home worshiping with the NFL or I'm at Starbucks worshiping caffeine, sugar, and whatever I'm streaming on Netflix or I'm wherever I am on a Sunday. I'm at brunch. Is there any bigger cultural declaration that I'm not at church than that the idea of a Sunday brunch even exists? You know what I mean? If, if we needed a clue that we're not a, a Christ-saturated culture anymore, how come Sunday brunch even exists? You know what I mean? I'm not saying that to throw any shade. I'm not saying brunch is bad. If you go over here to crepes and burgers, it's a beautiful thing. The glory of the Lord gets put into every crepe. But they also charge you. They're like, I'm sorry, we put extra glory in here. And then the bill is like, wow, that's a glorious bill. Um, I'm not throwing shade on brunch. But those of us who are Christians need to take a deep breath and ask ourselves, what types of ministry are working where? And what does America need from us? America gets into a religious fever pitch every four years, screaming at our politicians, I need this and we need this and I need this and we need this. And you know what no one is willing to say? None of the candidates are willing to say? Y'all need Jesus. No one says that. No one. That's not how you get elected. You do not get elected to power by standing up and saying, vote for Jesus. In fact, John the Baptist lived that out. His whole ministry was vote for Jesus. He must become greater. I must become less and less. In 2019, in the United States, if you're a Christian, I am asking you, how much ministry is people coming to Christians asking Bible questions? And how much ministry is us coming to our friends, coming to our family members, coming to our neighbors, coming to our classmates? If you're here today and you're not yet sure what you think of Jesus, I'm thrilled that you're here, but you are a small miracle. If you came today to hear truth because you're investigating, you're trying to figure out, you're a small miracle. People don't come to church anymore to find truth. They're surfing online. They're, asking, they're typing questions into Google. And whatever comes up, comes up. If you want a real exercise in American religion, type, is Jesus God? Type that into Google. And look at your first 10 to 15 answers. Who are the influencers? Whose blog posts are being read? We see in John 3 and 4, Sometimes someone might come toward Jesus. But in chapter 4, we see a couple of people that just didn't feel welcome at church for whatever reason. The church came to them. Let me ask you guys. Those of you who call ARCF your church home, I want you to ask you to think through and pray through, especially if you're a leader of a ministry. Are you a come and see ministry or are you a go and tell ministry? And neither of these, by the way, is better than the other. The point, the reason I'm pointing this out is that we see Jesus doing both. All throughout, all four Gospels, he is doing both. But I'm going to point, I am going to push on you and say that come and see ministry works best in a religious culture. If people already think they're religious, if they think they're already Christian. Imagine starting a church in Atlanta in 1955. A member of the mafia would come to church if they're in Atlanta in 1955. If everyone already views themselves as really religious, they're all going to come and listen to what you have to say. Go and tell is more and more necessary and more and more powerful in a truly pagan, non-religious culture. That's what I'm going to try to put forward to you. ARCF, I want you to ask yourself about our weekend services. These two services at 9 and at 1045. What we're doing right now is this come and see ministry or is this go and tell ministry? We have at least one vote for come and see. It's 
So there, there's not a whole lot of go and tell. This is literally our building. We paid for, well, we're still paying for it. The, the ARCF, church family, like we're on ARCF property right now. Now, obviously, I know you theological, it's God's property, okay? But it belongs to this local church family, and we use it for the proclamation of the gospel and any other ministries that can support and make disciples, right? But imagine, if you've never been to church and you walked onto this property, that's a small miracle. How, how much of an outsider do you feel if you've never been to church? And you come in here, and you're maybe a little bit terrified because everybody around you is one of those crazy Christians, the things about the blood of the lamb, but I just have some questions and maybe it's worth a shot. I met one of them and they were pretty nice. So this is terrifying. As a Christian, Emily and I were searching for a church a year and a half ago and we were visiting different churches each Sunday. We loved Jesus and we were terrified each week. It's just weird being an outsider in so many ways. Thank you to those of you guys who have joined in recent months. You courageously walked in the door you found out we were a bunch of uh, crazies and yet decided to love us anyway. Um, it's, it's such a courageous thing to show up, to stay. No, guys, this is come and see ministry. This is come and see ministry. You know we're going to teach the Bible. You're not shocked when I open the Bible, when you get up here. This is very, very, very Nicodemus and Jesus. This is very, very John 3. Okay? What about the food closet? I have one vote for come and see. One vote for go and tell. I put this one here on purpose because I think this one is a little bit mixed. The go and tell argument would be I am meeting your need. You have a need, right? The woman came for water and she got her ultimate need met. If we're feeding you because you do not have, the, you know, there's not enough money left at the end of the month. If we're feeding you, we're meeting a need. And if we especially make that uh, resource known to everybody throughout Citrus Heights and, and let people know, there's a degree to which I am going to you to at least to let you know that the need can be met. The come and see... Sure, sure. The come and see argument is that it's still on our property. But it is a ministry where we are not overtly preaching at you. It's not like, here, let me tell you about Jesus before I hand you this can of soup. No, no, no. You have to listen to my entire presentation before I give you the soup. It's really good soup, so hold on. You know, We don't do that. It's a little bit of both. In fact, in John 6, we're going to see a transition where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And droves of people leave Jesus. Right before that was what? The feeding of the 5,000. So he called him out on it. Look, when I feed you, you show up. But as soon as I tell you what it's going to actually be like to have your sins washed away, you're out. Toodles, I'm gone. All of mercy ministry has a transition. I'm giving you, living, I'm giving you water, I'm giving you food, I'm giving you shelter, and I'm going to offer you the risen Christ, and you will accept or you will reject. I'm going to love you and serve you because you're an image bearer. I'm going to serve you no matter what. But I will present you with the risen Christ, and you will make up your mind. Really, you don't make up your mind. You make up your heart. What about Kairos? This is the definition of go and tell. If you're serving the incarcerated, they cannot come to you, right? Physically cannot do it. This is go and tell ministry. So Kairos is not so much John 3. It is more John 4. Again, both biblical right there, right? It's go and tell. That was a short conversation. That was easy. What about Bible day camp? If you're a guest, I apologize. This is our VBS, our vacation Bible school for a week with the kids in the summer. What do you guys think? Come and see or go and tell? I think there's at least a small, there's a small go and tell angle in this sense. And I'm saying this as a parent of two children. If you will meet the need that every parent in Citrus Heights wants, hashtag free childcare. If you will provide free childcare, you are meeting a need. But it is on property and we're definitely telling your kid about Jesus. 
So it's heavily come and see in that regard. But children are excited about inflatables and arts and crafts and songs. You know what I mean? So it's a come and see. Let's say it's an attractional, a week-long attractional event. And the kids have a total blast if it's done well. And we did it well. Thank you guys who served this year. It's a go and tell when we say we're going to offer this to parents and grandparents that want to let their kids come over for three or four hours in that small sense. But largely, I would say it is come and see. The point isn't to come up with an answer. The point is to understand the ministry you're a part of. Amen? What about a person who calls ARCF their church home, you're a Christian, and you're sharing with your friend who Jesus is? What's that? Come and see or go and tell? When you are thinking about your friend who needs Jesus, it's go and tell. When you are praying for your friend that God would work in their life and draw their hearts toward him, that's go and tell. When you are thinking proactively and asking God for an opportunity to get into spiritual conversations, that's go and tell. And then all of a sudden, when the Holy Spirit, for no good reason, makes your neighbor walk across the lawn and strike up a conversation with you, all of a sudden it becomes come and see, doesn't it? But you couldn't force your neighbor to come to you, could you? We are in such an interesting culture that if I walk across the lawn to you, if I initiate, I'm a salesman. But if you walk across the lawn to me, we're neighbors. Isn't that interesting? I am not saying that the sum total of a Christian's evangelistic life in the U.S. needs to be asking God to create holy moments, but that's a great start. If you're a Christian and you're guilty of not asking God for nearly enough holy moments, raise your hand. Anybody guilty of not asking God for holy moments? I am super guilty. It's like we don't believe the Holy Spirit will do it. Jesus followed the Holy Spirit and what? A woman comes out to the well in the heat of the day. That's a miracle. Why is a woman coming out in the heat of the day? Well, there was shame because of her sexual behavior and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're over-explaining it. You're over-explaining it. Jesus did not know there was going to be a woman there. The scriptures tell us he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He lived a spirit-filled life and obeyed his Father. And then what happens? Holy moments. That's what following the Holy Spirit leads to. What about as we financially support different living links and missionaries who are planting churches and leading churches and leading ministries in different countries around the world? Is this come and see or is this go and tell? I guess it would depend on who you are. If you're a Christian in Citrus Heights, California who gave money into the bucket so that a portion of that money supports that missionary, that's very go and tell from your Northern Californian perspective. Somebody went, right? If you're existing in Citrus Heights right now, you're not listening to this online somewhere else, to you that's go and tell. Well, the Armstrongs are in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Of course that's go, because that's not here. But what if you're them? If you're the missionary who's being supported... They might have go and tell ministry going on. They might have come and see ministry going on. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Which one's more biblical? Thank you. Trying to get my main point across. Both of them biblical. Second point. Some of you guys were so excited. Oh, only two point sermon. It's going to be short. (laughs) Silly. Second point. God seeks worshipers, not theologians. Did you guys know that? And listen, I hope that I have convinced some of you the last 14 and a half months. I love theology. I teach theology. If you are sucking wind, you have a theology, whether you realize it or not. You believe something about God or the gods or goddess or Mother Earth. You have beliefs. We all have beliefs. 
And I don't know how to glorify God better than trying to move the needle in your beliefs so that you'll give him praise and honor and glory. I care about theology. But as I said earlier, Jesus does not take the opportune moment to correct your theology and say, you guys are all out of whack with this Gerizim thing, and you're out of whack because you rejected 80% of the Bible. He would have been 100% correct to say that to her, and he doesn't say it. Your problem is you threw out most of what I said, and that's why you're confused. You shot yourself in the foot. He could have rightly told her that, and he doesn't. Instead, he uses a a term of endearment. Dear woman, the time is coming. Actually, it's here, where the location of your worship is not going to matter. God is a spirit. We're hearing John pick up on this. He was already saying this in John 3. What's the nature of salvation? Well, the movement of the Holy Spirit transforming your heart is about as clear as the wind showing up, doing whatever it does, and leaving. Like, you felt that it did something. You saw it move the tree, but you can't explain where the wind came from. And you can't tell me where the wind is now. And Jesus is saying, this wind, this pneuma, God the Father is spirit, and he has got to be worshipped on a spiritual level. I'm trying so hard. We're talking about physical water, and I'm trying to talk to you about living water. I'm trying to get you to make this transition that I'm using this as an illustration. We are talking about spiritual water, and this spiritual connection to God necessarily means that the physical location of a temple will not matter anymore. And to put an exclamation point on uh, what he's trying to share with this lady, God sovereignly rips the temple curtain from top to bottom when Jesus dies. This temple does not matter anymore because the lamb, the high priest, and the temple were all the same person and we just killed him. The Holy of Holies is just outside the city where the refuse and the filth is. How on earth is the Holy of Holies out in Gehenna, hell? How is heaven gone to hell? That's what the cross is. I'm about to do something, dear woman. You don't see it coming. You don't understand it yet. But pretty soon, location is going to not be a part any longer of how God and man connect. Because if I shed my blood and the whole cosmos feel it, he's creating a church that exists across all peoples, all times, all locations. A father is seeking to make what? Worshippers. I'm not here to fix the details of what you think is correct or not correct, this or that. If I can make your heart worship me, you'll become a student of the word and you'll start submitting to it. You see how we get it backwards all the time? We think, I'm going to study my Bible and when I believe all the right things, I'm a Christian. No. When God changes your heart, you'll actually submit to the Bible instead of manipulating it to make it say what you want it to say. Anybody ever heard of Dan Brown? Dan Brown? One of a thousand examples we could give. Anybody can approach any book and twist it to make it say what you want it to say. Your heart has to change before you're going to understand the Bible. It just is. And if you're not a Christian, I'm not discouraging you saying don't read it. By all means, dive into the Gospels and see what the Bible says about Jesus. But if you fundamentally find God not trustworthy, you're just going to kind of look at the Bible like it's already shady and yeah, I don't know. The proof is right here in John 4. This woman has rejected 80% of the Bible. She's confused accordingly. But does she become convinced that she met the Messiah and run into town to tell everybody, I met the Messiah! With her bad theology and her distrust of 80% of the Bible, she becomes the most powerful, the first and most powerful uh, testifier of who Jesus is to what is essentially a pagan nation. Because she believed. We don't want to believe before we get our facts straight. We feel a sense of control by getting all of our ducks in a row. I have to know how all those animals fit onto the ark, and then I'll believe. I want to ask you guys, if you were going to start a new business to make a little money on the side, and you were a trained lifeguard, and you competed back in college, you did the 
100 meter breaststroke and, and you won a few ribbons and all that. You decide to make a side hustle. I am going to teach people how to swim. And you look around Citrus Heights and Roseville and you go, wow, there are already a lot of swim instructors. It's kind of a glutted market. I need to do something that nobody else has done, that nobody is doing anywhere. Would it be fair to say that you are the only one, if you decide, I know what market I'm going to do, I'm going to teach the breaststroke to dead people. Would it be fair to say that you're the only one? You just make it up on your website, you hand out flyers. You know anybody who's dead, who's interested in learning how to swim? They're going to lock you up if you pass out those flyers. They will find you, and they're going to lock you up. There's a reason they call it the dead man's float. There is no point in critiquing a dead person's form. Were you breathing as your head came up to the right? Were you visualizing yourself crossing the finish line first? Come on. There is no critique of form. You know, you're not strong. I think maybe the, the butterfly would be better for you. You don't have those conversations with dead people. Why? How big of a jerk do you have to be if somebody is drowning and you, you throw them a life preserver, if, if, they're, you know, if you get it close to them, that's very loving and that's very helpful. How helpful is that life preserver if they're already dead? They're literally not moving down in the water and you throw them a life preserver. This is what it's like to correct the theology of someone who does not trust God. I do not trust God. If there really was a loving God, our evening news wouldn't look the way it looks. I don't know about the Bible. Didn't they manipulate it? Didn't they play with it? Didn't they? And if you're a guest today, I know, again, I know I'm being offensive and calling you dead, but all I'm doing is repeating the words of Jesus. He calls you dead. By offering, what, living water that springs up inside the person providing eternal life, Jesus is calling you dead. Jesus has already called you dead. He's called me dead. We're all dead until and unless we drink of this living water, which is him. So be offended if you will. I'm not trying to offend. I actually believe Jesus calls us dead to wake us up. He's being honest. He wants us to understand how big of a deal it is to embrace him for all that he is. Throwing a life preserver to a dead person just doesn't work. So helping you understand the nuances of where did Cain get his wife? Did they really, you know, did God order the, sm the slaughter of the Amalekites? Well, what about that whole two types of clothing and blended fabrics thing? I don't, what about the not shaving your temple? That's kind of weird, yeah. When the Bible says over and over again that the gospel is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, Jews first and Gentiles, Paul in Romans 1.16. The message of who Jesus is is what makes us come alive. Not the rules. Romans 3.20 says the more we know God's law, the clearer it becomes we aren't obeying it. The verse before said no one can be justified before God by keeping the law. I could throw more rules at you, and even if you obeyed them perfectly somehow, you still have all the sins of all your past. You're still condemned before God. You need a new heart. Every single one of us needs a new heart. We're a dead man or dead woman walking, just trying to meet our physical needs, but when our Savior walks up, he says, look, I have something for you. I'll give it to you freely, and the reason you're not asking me is because you don't know who I am. That's what he said in the text. If you knew who was standing in front of you, you'd ask me for living water, and I'd give it to you. You're not asking because you don't know who I am. And where does the story lead us? The end of our text today. I am. We've, we've heard the I am's of Exodus. I am, 
provider. I am protector. Here it's I am the one standing in front of you. This would make a good Jewish boy soil himself. And I mean that. Isaiah 6, a good Jewish boy. The presence of the I am. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. I am from a people of unclean lips. I'm toast. She doesn't know her Bible well enough to be freaked out. She knows to be excited, and she is. If you're a guest today, I want you to ask yourself this question. Will I gladly accept Jesus' offer of eternal life, or will I get bogged down with demanding answers to secondary questions? This is perhaps one of the biggest temptations in the 21st century Western world. Will I shake my fist at the Almighty and demand that he answers some of my questions when he tells us over and over and over, the main thing is whether or not my cross was effective in offering you forgiveness. He tells us over and over that that's the main thing. Will we trust that he is telling us the truth and that is the main thing? And he can lead us into understanding of other things later, things that are secondary. Or am I going to get bogged down on secondary issues? If you're a young single guy and you meet Miss Wright and you're worried that she's a Green Bay Packers fan because you are a diehard Chicago Bears fan and you come and you talk to godly men in the church and they know her and they know her family and they go, wow, this is an unbelievably godly young lady. You seem to be chasing after Jesus. I think this would be a good thing. I think you guys could glorify God together. And you just kind of shake your head. I don't know, she's a Packers fan. The elders are going to tell you, you are making a mountain out of a molehill. You are taking a secondary issue and you are elevating it. And I am here through the Gospel of John to beg you, if Jesus died a horrifying death in your place and freely offers you the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, do not get bogged down with secondary questions. Don't do it. If you already love Jesus, I want you to ask yourself this. Is my proclaiming between come and see ministry and go and tell, is it balanced? Is my proclaiming balanced? There are different ways to proclaim. I'm going to tell who Jesus is because you came to me. I'm going to tell Jesus because I came to you. Am I respecting that God sovereignly put John 3 in the Bible and put John 4 in the Bible? He wrote it, not me, not you. If I am a Christian, which ministry am I a part of? Maybe you're not called to be balanced. I'm not suggesting that you have to be balanced. I just want you to think about it if you're a Christian. Okay? If Wayne is supposed to give all of his spare time to Kairos, then we want Wayne to do that. Say amen. Amen. Okay? So if God has told you to do something, go do it. But I do want you to ask yourself this question, and here's why I'm asking you to think it through if you're a Christian. I believe that the current cultural climate of the West and even of the West Coast is going to demand more and more and more go and tell. That's my personal conviction. So I want us to be thinking through. I want us to not accidentally have a church where 80% of our energy is on come and see when what the culture needs is a little bit more of go and tell. Does that make sense? There are going to be cultures that need John 3 to, to, to find Christ. There are going to be cultures that need John 4 to find Christ. Does that make sense? Nope, not a single, okay. All right, you guys are just upset that I went long and you want to go get snacks. So we're going to pray because if we do not ask God to come in and wreck our hearts with the text, then we will have wasted our time, amen? All right, so we're going to take the next three, four, five minutes and we're going to pray. If you're an elder or an elder's wife uh, and you'd be willing to serve as a prayer counselor, uh, pastor, you know, love to have you guys serve in that way. Um, so that we could come and receive prayer if we want it, if we need it. If you'd like to pray where you are in your chair, you're welcome to do that. Pray up front if you'd like. Maybe you in your notes, you need to write down your one takeaway of what the Holy Spirit communicated to you today through the text of an action step that you need to take. Uh, please do that. Please share it with a friend in your disciple group this week of what God told you. Uh, we're going to take this time to respond because without response, we are 
Pharisees. We are hearers only if we do not respond in glad submission and glad worship to our Savior Jesus. Amen? All right, I'll come up in just a bit to dismiss us. Jesus, thank you so much for coming and finding us when we were not looking for you. Jesus, please keep seeking and saving the lost. Seek here in our city and let us be a part. In the beautiful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. God's people said. Love you guys. Have a great week.